It is really lovely to see all of you here this morning. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Come into his courts with praise. And we remain standing to sing 1086 from Mission Praise, Light of the World. Set. We're going to use the prayers on page 19. Let us pray. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a humble spirit, a humble and repentant heart, O God, you will not reject. Since we have complete freedom to go into the most holy place by means of the death of Jesus, let us come near to God with a sincere heart and pray together, saying, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against one another in thought, word, and deed, through negligence, through weakness, 
through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Lord, have mercy upon us. <coughs> Lord, have mercy upon us. God, the Father, maker of heaven and earth. God, the Son, Saviour of the world. God, the Holy Spirit, guide and comforter. Holy, blessed and glorious Trinity. Let us give thanks to the Father. He rescued us from the power of darkness and brought us safe into the kingdom of his dear Son, by whom we are set free and our sins forgiven. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And I'm going to ask, Ruth, would you give us our first reading from Genesis now? Our first reading is Genesis chapter 9, verses 8 to 17. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth. I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be cut off by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. So God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant I have established between me and all life on the earth. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> I have just come back from a lovely stay with my cousin and his wife in Lincolnshire. And you'll hear a bit more about that later on. But he's very proud of himself. He's bought himself a mobility scooter and I think it's changed what he can do. So we headed off to Lincoln Cathedral. And it's a beautiful cathedral if you've ever been there. And I want you to have a look at this picture. Do you know what it is? It's an art installation called Gaia. And it's a huge model of the Earth. You can see how big it is 
by the scale of the people underneath. And it's hanging in the cross place of the cathedral. I know there's a, a name for it. You know, there's the high altar at the back, and then there's the two cross wings, and then the nave going down. It's absolutely massive, and it's hanging there. You show the next one. It fills the space. And I don't know about you, but I thought it was just so delicate, so fragile, hanging there. And I wondered if that was how God saw the earth. Beautiful, fragile, delicate. And reading the first chapters in Genesis makes us realize that God made the earth and he loved it. It was very good. And we know from the story of Noah's Ark that the earth had gone bad. God sent a flood to clean it up, to get rid of all the badness. And then he made a fresh start because he put, what did he put into the ark? Yes, Oscar. All the animals. How many of each did he put? Two. Two by two. That's brilliant. So, you know the story really well then. Noah made the ark and all the animals, two by two, went into the ark. And so they were saved. And that tells us something about how important God thought the animals were, as well as Noah's family. So they all went into the ark. And... We know that they came out from the ark and repopulated the world. But God loves every living creature. And that covenant, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later on, is between God and all living creatures. Now, I got here just because I was thinking about living creatures when I went to the spa. I've got sour worms. Oh, sour worms. Does anybody like sour worms? Ruth, oh dear, there's deadly competition here. <laughs> Ruth, are you going to give up sour worms for Oscar and Benjamin? She might. <laughs> You're on to a winner here. Right. Yeah, I'm going to give sour worms. Right, well, I've got more. Right, hold on. What about turtles? Does anybody like beetles eating turtles? Sophie, you're going to have to put your hand, and Megan, you're going to have to put the hand up again. What about white mice? Does God like white mice? Do you like eating them? Erin, right. Erin, what do you like? Mini beer cats or sour bears? Who's on for sour bears? Sophie. Yes. <laughs> I was amazed at the different variety of sweets that spa had um, in terms of animals. And I just thought, that's just lovely, eating those different animals. And a reminder, a really tangible reminder, that God made the world, and he loves you and me. He really does. But he loves all of creation as well. And he made not just us, he made the world and everything that's in us. And I want you to look at the next picture. What's that? Is anybody, where is it? It's a rainbow. Absolutely right, Oscar. It's a rainbow and it's just over Mrs. Hamill's house. 
I don't know about you, but I have seen some beautiful rainbows here, but I never have my camera with me to snap them. But that's right, and what is a rainbow? What's a rainbow? That is brilliant, Benjamin. So, a rainbow comes when sunlight goes through raindrops. And it's a sign that the rain is about to stop. Because you only see the rainbow when the sun is starting to come through. So you've got a reminder that God promised that never again would he destroy the earth by flooding it. So today, I want you to remember that God loves us. He loves all the creatures around us. He loves the world. But just like that world that we saw in Lincoln Cathedral, it is delicate and it's too easy for us to destroy it. So I hope you enjoy finishing the sweets and we're going to sing one of my favorite hymns now, Who Put the Colors in the Rainbow? Five oh three. People will go out to Children's Church. The second reading is Mark chapter 1, verses 9 to 15. The baptism and temptation of Jesus. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. 
After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. <coughs> this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We sing again a song that echoes that reading. It's 160 from Mission Praise, 40 days and 40 nights. As I mentioned earlier, I've just come back from a few days away with my cousin and his wife. And they've been to Grace Hill a couple of times. So they, they know the settlement, they know um, the church. I don't think they've been in for a service other than my consecration, but they know the area. So it was lovely to be able to go out and spend time with them. And I think COVID has changed a number of things. We certainly used to have services here on Ash Wednesday. And then COVID came and afternoon and evening services and certainly services like Ash Wednesday, we didn't hold them. And I'm never sure whether we ought to start rethinking really about that or whether it puts too much pressure on people. But all I can say is, that I loved going to the Ash Wednesday service with Martin and Nikki. It's very traditional. I think you might say um, quite a high Anglican church. And the service was very sparse. Every flower had been removed from the church in the traditional way. And halfway through the service, we were invited to go up and be ashed. Now, I know that's not part of Protestant 
tradition here. But certainly there's lots of Church of England churches that would do that. So I went forward with everyone else to be ashed. And actually it's very sobering because the minister stands there with ash and olive oil. And I can't remember the exact words, but he marks a cross on your forehead. And he effectively says, dust you are, and to dust you will return. And it just makes you think. And then you walk away and the next person works forward. And I think that is a really effective start to a time of reflection. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not going to start doing it here. But it made me pause and think. Bear church, reminder of death, time of repentance during Lent. And of course, typically Lent is marked by giving something up. Mortifying the flesh and being aware of our limitations. Now, I think that's what we were doing, but in a very different way at Coromila. But you know, I wasn't here last weekend because we had the weekend at Coromila. And all I can say is it was much jollier than the Ash Wednesday service, but it was looking at the same thing, just a completely <coughs> different way. Because at Coromila, we were in a very practical way considering our own mortality. The big difference was there was a lot of fun, a lot of chat, and an awful lot of cake. So I would like to say thank you to everybody who baked and sent up cakes for the weekend because it was fabulous. Every coffee break, cake. Cake in the evening, it was lovely. But at Coromila, we were looking at what's called Laban's life or your life story. And this was a tradition that started in Herrenhut with Count Zinzendorf. Everybody was encouraged to write down their life story and then it was read at their funeral. So you wrote it down knowing that this would be read publicly at the end of your life. And you were asked to write down what was important and how God had dealt with you through your life. So it wasn't just, it wasn't the classic testimony that you get in some services, and they are very valuable, because it went past the conversion point. It went on till, well, how did you live after that? How, what happened? What were the high points? What did you learn from it? And then apparently in Germany, the tradition is that everybody writes in the Moravian church, everybody writes a Laban's life. That's read at the funeral. Then you go towards the burial. Then you come back and you have the funeral tea. And different people stand up at the funeral tea and tell stories about you. So all the reflective, funny stories, or the things people say, oh, that was in the Laban's life, and I remember that. So that's told afterwards. And apparently, there's over 30,000 Laban's lives or life stories held in the Full Neck archives. Now, some of these are extraordinary stories, and you'll see a Reverend Shawkirk up on the um, notice board there. And we have in the Grace Hill archives his wife's Laban's life, his wife's life story that she dictated out to people here. And that was read at her funeral here. And it's an extraordinary story about growing up in um, Pennsylvania in the States, about marrying a minister, about going out to the Caribbean, about him dying, coming back. The American, um, was, I can't remember whether it was war against War of Independence. Yeah, it was War of Independence, going to Heron Hook, coming here. It's incredible. So some of these life stories are really amazing. Some of them are about ordinary men and women. And that's the joy of the Moravian archives because they are an incredible history of the lives of ordinary people who didn't do great travels and the rest of it, but how, they, how faith affected them and what their life was like. So 30,000 of them in the Heronhood archives. And we were given instructions that had been written for writing a Laban's life. So it's just the 
in this, it is very similar to being reminded of your mortality by having a cross marked on your forehead. But this is, in this way, very similar because it suggests that you put down the important facts in your life first. Date of birth, baptism date, um, confirmation, confirmation text, education, where you studied, when you retired, when you got married, um, important grandchildren and grandchildren, and important things in the life, and other important experiences. And Bishop T.O. Gill wrote this about writing one. He said, it is true that there are understandable and recurrent excuses for not writing a spiritual memoir. The main excuses are one, I haven't done anything special in my life. Two, I have no talent for writing. Three, my private life is and shall remain my secret. All of these may be true, but you don't really believe your life is nothing special to you. Have you never asked why exactly that particular thing happened to me? Or why should I have been chosen to experience this particular thing? The shocking, the inspiring, the depressing, the outrageous. As I experience them belong to my life story. And therefore I may also write something about them. Number two, that you are not a writer is probably true. Therefore, we will leave the 100-page autobiographies to the experts. A Laban's life is not a piece of literature. But you will surely be able to manage a couple of pages about what has been important in your life. And when you are not able, for example, you are no longer physically able to write, you can tell your story or dictate it to someone you trust. And then lastly, number three, Perhaps your life story contains something which you have now kept to yourself. No one is requiring you to reveal more of yourself than you are willing. A Laban's life is not to be seen as a confession or a settling of accounts with others. These things have no place in public, even in the limited public space of the congregation. So just a story of your life, not settling scores, not uh, owning up to stuff that you really don't want up to own up to, but the story of your life and how God has been there. And I gather that people typically start writing it when they retire and they add to it over the years. And sometimes people will write one for the funeral and a longer one for their family, their family history. So I suppose what I'm saying is... What about using this Lent to think about your life? Not necessarily to give anything up or to take on an extra burden, but just to think about those key points when you knew God was there, when you knew you had turned to God. Was it sudden or was it over a long period? Who was important to you? What struggles have you had? And how has God been there with you? Very frequently, people write down too what Bible passages have meant a lot to them. What hymns would you want? And do you need to make or remake your will? So a lot to think about over Lent. And sometimes it's very difficult but for Christian people, we have a hope. We believe that death is not the end, that death is swallowed up in victory. And that is the victory brought to us by the perfect life, the sacrificial death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. And Jill used, Jill was leading the weekend, she used one glorious phrase, now, we sometimes talk about the church on earth and the church triumphant or the church militant, the church in heaven. But she used a phrase that is used in circles in Germany. She talked about the upper congregation. So they would typically talk not of the church triumphant, but of the upper congregation. 
We think of the great cloud of witnesses who in every age have been faithful unto death. The upper congregation. And we're fond of saying that Grace Hill is Moravian theology expressed in stone and layout. But that really is true for the upper congregation as well. You walk out from here, you join the upper congregation in the burial ground. Grace Hill is not just about equality. It's not just about gender access. It's also about the church here and the upper congregation. The people who have molded this place, the people who were the faithful departed before us. Jesus, in that reading from Mark's gospel, goes into the wilderness. He doesn't go. It, he says he's driven into the wilderness. So whether it's an external driving force, whether it's an internal force that demands that he goes and sets time aside to prepare himself for what was ahead. So we use Lent typically to prepare ourselves for Easter. But we can do it by reviewing our lives, whatever age we are, so that we can give an account of our life and faith. But I don't just want to leave it there because our first reading from Genesis taught me something too that I'd really not taken in before. I'm not looking at the word covenant here. We'll look at that in future services. For this purpose, covenant is just a sacred promise. But I had not appreciated that this promise to Noah and all his descendants, to all humankind, I'd appreciated that. But I hadn't really grasped <clears throat> that it's not just for humankind. <coughs> it's for every living creature. Every living creature, verse 10. Every living creature, verse 12. Every living creature, verse 15. Every living creature, verse 16. This is such a serious promise that all flesh is not just human flesh. God's sacred promise is to the earth and all that's in it. And I suppose that's not surprising given the love and the care and the pleasure that's expressed in Genesis chapter 1, that beautiful creation narrative. And it's an intimacy and a living close to nature that our rather detached lifestyle doesn't have. Reading recently, the Bible readings have been in numbers. Balaam and his donkey, where the donkey questions why Balaam is hitting him. Psalm 104, where God's provision for the wild animals is acknowledged and celebrated. And Jesus in his parables, the use of the fields and the wild life around him. Seeds, birds, flowers, grass. The Bible is a fantastic nature book and it is of God and it matters to God. So this Lent, as well as rightly contemplating your life story and God's hand, his touch on your life, you could also reflect on the rest of his creation, the promise he made not to destroy it again and yet our willful destruction of it. How can we honour the God who lavished love on this world? How can we reduce our destructive impact on it? How can we as a church, as Christians, as a community, honour the creation and every living creature? I think this matters. There is faith expressed in words and in writing in a Laban's life. There's also faith expressed in what we do in what we have, in what our priorities and our cares are. So two tracks this Lent, the words, the life story, and the deeds, what we do and how we live it. So this Lent, I started very somberly, but I want to finish with joy because God has given us so much. He has given us family, he has given us friends, he has set us in a beautiful world, we have so much to be thankful for. And we live not in dread of God, but in thankfulness for all that he has given us. Amen.
We're going to sing number 16, Lead Us, Heavenly Father, Lead Us. We turn back to the liturgy books, to the bottom of page 21. Let us pray that we may hold fast to the truth of Christ amid all the dangers and temptations of life. From indifference to the love shown in your suffering and death, from error and misunderstanding, from pride, vanity, and hardness of heart, from selfish ambition, from accepting the false standards of this world, from greed and materialism, from envy, hatred, malice, and every failure of love, from unnecessary perplexity and anxiety, from all sin. Let us find strength and comfort in Christ. By your humble birth and holy life, by your baptism, fasting and temptations, by your obedience and faithfulness, by your enjoyment of the Father's good gifts, by your ministry in word and deed, by your giving of yourself to others, by your prayers and tears, by your having been despised and rejected, by your agony and passion, by your dying words, by your cross and reconciling death, by your triumphant resurrection, by your glorious ascension, by your sending the Holy Spirit, by your word and sacraments, by your living presence, by your coming again in glory. Lord, you are the head of the church. Direct and watch over it so that it may be a faithful instrument of your purposes. Strengthen and support those who suffer for the sake of the gospel. And we lift to you Christians across the world who find it difficult to be together who suffer in different ways for their faith, those with outright persecution, and those who know that their chances are limited because of their profession of your son's name. Unite the people of God. Increase our understanding of the mystery of God. Use us to show ever more clearly the glory of your life, death, and resurrection. 
Watch over all who work for the spread of the kingdom of God. Let your spirit and power inspire their witness by word and deed. Give to bishops and ministers a true understanding of your word and a Christ-like concern for your people. Guide those who bear office and strengthen all your people for mission to witness and serve in love. Guide in the ways of justice and peace all who have responsibility for ruling the nations of the world. Give wisdom to all those in authority. Deliver us from the sin which gives rise to wars and violence. And we lift to you, Lord, those places of strife in our world today. We lift to you, Israel, the West Bank and Gaza. We lift to you, Sudan and the Yemen, Syria, Myanmar, and so many other places. Teach us so to order our life together that the kingdoms of the world may reflect the kingdom of God. Lord, bless the people of this land. Cleanse us from all evil. Teach us to serve one another in love. Help us to be faithful in our daily lives. And give us the strength to withstand the adverse pressures and influences of modern society. Grant peace and safety with justice for all. Strengthen family life and grant wisdom and understanding to those with responsibility for the care and nurture of children and young people. Lord, send help to all in distress or danger. Defend the defenceless, comfort the lonely and sad, support the sick, the anxious and the bereaved. And in their weakness with suffering, let them know your love. Comfort the dying with your presence and peace and with the hope of eternal life. Yes. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Yes. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Yes. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Yes. And now to him who is able to keep us from falling and to bring us faultless and joyful before his glorious presence. To the only God, our Saviour, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, might and authority from all ages past, now and forever and ever. Amen. We stand to sing our last hymn, 356, three, Jesus is Lord. <coughs>
go now and live in the spirit of your baptism, even when you were led into wild and hard places. With repentance and trust, give yourselves to God with fasting and prayer. Strengthen yourselves against the ways of the tempter. And may God enfold you in tender and lasting love. May Christ be beside you in times of struggle. And may the Spirit guide you back to the path whenever you stray, that you may keep the covenant. Amen. <laughs>